How about what's the most beautiful sight you've ever seen? See, now that's one I really can't answer. I have no idea. <laughs> the most beautiful. You know, all these things are so uh, contextual. Most beautiful when? And, you know, what was your state of mind? And were you hungry? <laughs> you know, I mean, it could have been a piece of cake. But, yeah. No, I don't, I, that's a question I don't know how to answer because there's so many things that are beautiful. Welcome to my viewfinder. My name is David Young. I'll be publishing a new episode every Friday where we discuss the philosophies around photography. I've decided to start adding projects and challenges at the end of each episode, so don't forget to check that out. Let me know how you're doing in the comment section, or you can reach me on Instagram at myviewfinderpodcast, on Twitter at mvfpodcast, or uh, just email me at dyunphoto at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. If you're enjoying what you're hearing and you want to keep up with all the new ideas, hit that subscribe button, maybe even give me a like, and hopefully this will help you get out there and start taking more pictures. My Viewfinder is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. You can find this podcast and a litany of Albertan grown podcast content on their website, albertapodcastnetwork.com. Here's an Albertan podcast that you might be interested in. Hello and welcome to That's a Thing, a sometimes belated, already outdated guide to your teens, tweens, and everything under 20. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Karen. Every month we have a conversation across the generation gap about media, pop culture, society, the internet, that kind of thing. Karen is my mom, and she's old. <laughs> I am her daughter, and I am young. Together, we are one human being, here to share with you. Uh, sometimes we bring in another human being, who is Elizabeth's brother, John, to do a deep dive into memes and stuff like that. Hi. Thank you, John. Uh, we were named the Outstanding Kids and Family Series at the 2020 Canadian Podcast Awards, so we have that going for us. Yes, and we will brag about it until the day the podcast ends, because I am petty. <laughs> You can find That's a Thing in the podcatcher of your choice. That is That's a Thing, question mark, exclamation point. You can also find us at albertapodcastnetwork.com. Is that everything? I think that's it. Thanks, sweetheart. Bye. Today I sit down with Donna Schwartz, professor, photographer, ethnographer. I learn how her journey from the streets of Philadelphia her years of research through Minneapolis, and ultimately her arrival here in Calgary have culminated in a body of work that combine research, social commentary, and photography. They're more than just pretty pictures. They're projects that help us understand something about not just ourselves, but perhaps the world around us. Here's my chat with Donna. Remember to stick around to the end. I'm going to start reviewing some of the concepts we cover in these discussions and potentially find a project for us to work on together. Do you think, I mean, it, 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 as a photographer, is there sort of a intuition of something to do with light? Or as you brought up, do you think for you, you feel things more in context? Like, uh, I have met some photographers that all they talk about is uh, is light. It's it's kind of almost a cult. <laughs> um, but do you find that you like interact with the world in a different way that something like this, like a beautiful sight, actually has kind of a wider meaning? Um, is that why it's difficult to answer? I well, I, you know, it's, um, I'm not after particular formal elements uh, when I photograph. I'm about meaning. So um, I appreciate light. I mean, photographers generally do. But, you know, when I'm thinking about photographing things, I'm thinking in terms of, um, I, I work in projects. Uh, so I'm really sort of asking questions and watching things unfold. And so, uh, you know, I wouldn't ever say that I was going out to make photographs of light, although I've heard people say that. So, but that's just not my shtick. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, I mean, let's talk about projects then. I mean, I, you know, for my part, I, I probably have to learn 
conceptually to think more in a uh, framework, but um, you know, maybe you could start off by briefly describing what a project-oriented uh, photography practice is. So, uh, yeah, maybe moving in a different direction than this intuitive snapshot, uh, quote-unquote, street photography. What what do you mean by project? Yeah, so um, generally something is motivating the work that I do. And so um, for me, working in a sort of project framework means that there's some question or series of questions that I'm interested in. And um, I'm using the camera as a way of exploring those questions and uh, thinking through what it is that I'm encountering, seeing, photographing. And that sort of generates the next steps that I take as I'm moving forward in the work that I'm doing. When you approach it, it... How do you keep sort of an open mind that it isn't pointing to a foregone or biased conclusion? I mean, so I guess in my mind, I'm thinking, um, I mean, I don't have a specific project, but that you've asked a question, how do we not already have um, an intended direction that might form how you want to display or set up um, the images that you are going to form? Um, Like, is it... I don't necessarily have a problem with that in and of itself. So let me describe a project that I did that I think um, had a very open-ended kind of question and was really about seeing things that would give me ideas about how I might answer that question. So I um, did a project called In the Kitchen and it started um, actually on a, <laughs> in a November many years ago when it was my birthday and I was recently divorced and my kids, uh, were with me and my mom was at the house and a good friend of mine was at the house and they were all making me birthday dinner. And they said, go in the living room and relax. And, uh, we're going to make dinner for you. Just take it easy. Just, you know, relax, do whatever you want. And so it was like, okay, there's all this stuff going on in the kitchen and I'm sitting out in the living room and thinking, well, there's nothing going on here. (laughs) I want to go back in the kitchen. Uh, So I got my camera and I started photographing them making dinner for me on my birthday. And I realized that um, the kitchen was an important place in family life. And here I was at this particular moment in my own life where my family by, you know, sort of um, popular consensus was a broken family because I was divorced. And so I started wondering, well, if this is a broken family, what is what is a family that's whole? And so I started photographing my family in the kitchen. And this is a tiny little kitchen. So I was just photographing interactions among the people who would pass through my kitchen. And I met my partner. I think I had already met him at that point. Pretty sure. And uh, yes, I had. (laughs) Um, We decided that we were going to look for a house together and blend our families. And we had a five-year plan. So it was going to be like a couple years down the road from this particular moment in time. Um, We wanted the kids to be older. We wanted to be sure of the relationship. We wanted, you know, everything to to be... um, a positive rather than a disruptive and uh, negative experience for our kids. But we found the perfect house before five years. So it ended up being a three-year plan. So the project moved into this new house and I was a little concerned at that moment that, wow, this is an interesting project and it's going really well. And if I move, is that gonna end the project? But um, what it did instead was to shift the focus. And so the question then became, uh, you know, here we have these two uh, different threads, two different familial threads. And Ken and his kids are coming out of a different broken situation, but they have familial traditions and ways of doing things that... um, are just a part of their conception of what is normal. 
you get some dog barking on the soundtrack here. It's it's that. No need for sound natural. effects. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so they had one set of traditions and ideas about how to do things. And then I and my kids had a different set of assumptions and traditions. And at that point, the, the project sort of came to encompass how it is that you reconstruct or construct family. Can you take these two separate threads and how can you intertwine them and how might that work or might it not work? And so the camera moved from one kitchen into another and uh, I photographed for two and a half years just in the kitchen. So it was uh, all the kinds of things that would happen in the kitchen. And what I was looking for were these moments where you could see family uh traditions being performed, family relationships being performed, and how they might change over time. And so it was a really interesting exploration. I did not know what it would look like. Uh, the only thing that I knew is that I was only photographing in the kitchen. And, you know, that was a, a set of parameters that I set for the project based on the idea that if you wanted to understand family and family dynamics, you could photograph in this one domestic environment and learn pretty much everything you needed to know. So, you know, that's, so that was about those kinds of questions, you know, how do we pass values from one generation to the next? How do we pass ideas about how to do things and how to be in the world. And could you see that happening, you know, in the kitchen as uh, interactions were taking place? And so I learned a number of things. I saw lots of instances of these intergenerational patterns of behavior emerging, which I thought were fascinating. But I also learned that parents, adults are not as, uh, singly influential as I thought we didn't we don't have all the power so the kids were influencing one another just as much as we were influencing them and that was also really fascinating to see the interactions of younger kids with older kids and how they were like watching very carefully how their siblings behaved and modeling that behavior themselves so, so you can see, I, I would not be going out and looking for light. <laughs> what I was concerned with in this uh, situation was, do I have light and do I need more? And if I need more, where am I going to get it? And, you know, is it going to look okay? So the, I mean, just to take it right back, um, would you say that you've always approached photography this way or is it something you developed um, as you learn to practice your practice so to speak because uh, it it has such an intentional and uh documentarian uh structure around it i mean even i was you know the second question i suppose is the uh, when in, during your birthday party and you see everybody congregating in the kitchen the fact that you picked up your camera to document it is a fascinating thing in my mind immediately because that's such a it's such a specific intentional process like i i don't know there would be many people that would just either muscle their way in to make sure they're cooking correctly or turn on netflix and just disappear into a couch but you did have an intuition uh, however the thought process may be to pick up your camera so it i don't know it tells me something a little bit that there's uh already a pre-established uh, approach to when you even use the tool. Um, do you think that's something that is part of just how you think, or is it something that has developed as you've learned, I suppose, to become a photographer? Uh, well, it's my background is a bit unusual. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's a fair thing to say. When I started photographing as a teenager, because I've been photographing for a really long time, I photographed like a street photographer, uh, like many people. And I lived in a city, so that was helpful. There was a lot of stuff happening on the street, so I could just go out and walk with my camera and, and photograph. So that work was not really about anything other than reacting to my surroundings, but I always have been interested in photographing people interacting. And I'm sure I must get that from my father because he was really um, <laughs> kind of uh, interested in, in watching people. And uh, that was all fine to, you know, be doing street photography. But um, I ended up going to graduate school 
and learned ethnographic research methods as a part of the the research that I was doing. At the time, I was not actively photographing, but I was studying photography. So um, I wrote a dissertation about, and this is going to sound very academic to you, uh, about uh, the construction of value in the fi- world of fine art photography, how it is that standards were created again, in social groups that would allow photographers to distinguish between what constituted art photography versus amateur photography. So I spent a couple of years going to a camera club and observing and participating in camera club meetings. Uh, And then I went to art openings for photo shows in the city of Philadelphia. And, you know, this is a time where there weren't that many photo galleries. I think there were maybe three in the city, maybe just two. And I mean, there still aren't that many photo galleries. There's not a single one here. So I did participant observation and then I interviewed people. I interviewed camera club members and I interviewed uh, fine art photographers. And just to throw a name out there, I had a very, very long interview. It must have run six hours at least with Ray Metzger. Uh, So that was um, everybody told me, oh, he won't talk to you. He won't do an interview. (laughs) It's like, oh, yeah, no, you will. Um, And that was really interesting. I learned to do uh, ethnography and, you know, I was always involved with photography in some way. And when I was in graduate school, it was studying photography and uh, other people's work in photography instead of doing my own. And then later in my career, when I was an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, and I was teaching photography there, it became, it was revealed to me that in terms of the standards for um, earning tenure, you could do creative work. And I was like, what? You can? (laughs) <laughs> because I thought, okay, the only way to get tenure is, you know, to write journal articles and, and get those published in peer-reviewed journals and, you know, that sort of normal pathway for someone in the social sciences to get tenure. And I said, no, no, you can. You know, the thing was, I was always really uh, kind of headstrong and didn't sort of look at the odds of success necessarily uh because yeah you can but is it going to be the easier path or the much more difficult path because in fact people aren't going to know how to evaluate what you do but you know once that door was open just a crack i went through it so i got a series of grants and decided to do uh, a photographic ethnography of a rural farm community in northeastern iowa and I didn't know exactly what I was doing, except that it seemed super exotic to me because this was a town of 300 people and I grew up in Philadelphia and like, how do you even exist in a town of 300 people? What is that like? And so I was pretty naively exploring what it was like to be living in a rural community at this particular moment in time. So I used the training that I had, my uh, ethnographic research methods. At the time, there was like nothing written about visual ethnography. Yeah, there was nothing. (laughs) Uh, So it was, you know, at a point in time where you just made it up as you went along. And then I wrote about the methods that I used later on, uh, because, uh, you know, once you make it up as you go along, you actually start to codify it and it becomes part of the literature in the field that other people then kind of go to and follow. But I photographed in this town and it was a very interesting experience for a city girl to be photographing in this community where they all knew who I was. And I had no idea how they knew that. (laughs) That's because I didn't know anything about small towns. But little by little, I got to know people, I made friends, uh, and I got to photograph their day-to-day lives on some level. But it was sort of my first experience of doing research with a camera uh, that was a kind of exploration of a cultural milieu in a place that, uh, you know, was to me uh, an unknown. It was like exploring something that 
was very foreign to me. And I struggled to come up with the um, the glue that held it all together. It was It was actually kind of hard because, you know, what I was doing in the beginning was just very descriptive. I was photographing categories of things that I had a list to go out and do. So like, what does the place look like? What's the main street like? What are the businesses? What are the churches? What are the the taverns? Uh, you know, where do people hang out? And then, you know, who lives here? And what's the work like? And, you know, so on. And then I had all these photographs and it's like, wow, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> So that was um, an interesting challenge to figure out how to pull it all together. But I also uh, I had a book contract for that work. So that was that was really important in terms of, you know, sort of like having the um, the goal, you know, the, the reward at the end of it was that I knew that if I made a convincing piece from this work uh that there was that outlet for it at the end so that was that was like the first time that i had an immersion experience of photographic research and of course my work has changed over time dramatically from that project but that was the beginning of it and so it's not like i've always been oriented towards that it's like the convergence of the fact that i was in graduate school learning to do qualitative research which was what i gravitated towards immediately because i was not interested in quantitative work although i recognized that it has value but that wasn't that just wasn't me and so integrating a camera into that was a way of sort of like reconnecting with uh, my love of photography that had sustained research about photography. And then the moment that I could bring the practice of photography into my research, you know, I really snatched that opportunity and um, I never turned back. That was it. Just uh, quickly, can you define ethnography for me? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So uh, ethnographic research is um, research that is often characterized by observational methods uh, where you will you'll identify a research question and a way of uh, a place, an activity, an event that will give you some of the answers to that uh, question that you've posed, and then you go and you observe. You may do informal interviewing along the way. Uh, you write field notes that allow you then later to remember what you've seen because otherwise you forget. And the field notes are your gold, right? You go back to that and that's where your inferences come from because you've written down all of these things that you've observed and you try to do it in a way that uh, is just very descriptive, as neutral as you can be, although, and I'm sure that ethnographic practices have changed enormously over time, but you can also like have a sideline of all the things you're feeling about all those descriptive things that you've just put down, knowing that your descriptions are coming out of a, a perspectival place. So observation is a foundational part. Interviewing can be uh, an important part. So with all the photographs that I made in that Iowa town, I assembled them into categories and then I went and I interviewed people and showed them photographs. Ethnographic interviewing doesn't necessarily include that kind of photo elicitation method, but it can. I interviewed three generations in four different farm families to see how their experiences of living in a rural community uh, were the same or different. And that was what ended up being the focus of, of the work was how do people who have grown up in very different moments, historical moments, how do they see the lives that they're leading in this tiny town? This episode was brought to you by the Calgary Foundation. Whether it's funding anti-racism programs, addiction recovery, or food hampers for the hungry, for 65 years, the Calgary Foundation has proudly supported the charitable community to address some of Calgary's biggest challenges. Now, 
During this period of unprecedented urgent needs, Calgary Foundation renewed its commitment to building a healthy, vibrant, giving, caring, and resilient community. If you're a registered charity looking for a grant, a professional advisor creating a giving plan for your client, or a donor wanting to give back to community, discover a wealth of resources at calgaryfoundation.org and learn more about their work through Calgary Foundation's Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. So, how do we build a researcher's mind? I think what we should set out to do today is to think about something that moves us, be it a passionate hobby or a particular irritant. Then we can ask ourselves how we might express our relationship with this thought through images. As Donna expresses, this approach may start off as a seemingly random set of pictures. But, if we can keep a singular theme or passion at the core, they will begin to turn into something larger. Something that may speak to others as much as they speak to ourselves. The road to building photographic projects is to start with moments that inspire us to act. So my challenge is to look for that thing and to start shooting. I'm cheating a little bit as I'm actually in Donna's class right now, but personally, I'm starting off with my epilepsy. What that means in the end is anyone's guess, but I'm going to start building from something that has deeply affected how I go about living day to day. What's a, an opinion that you have that might surprise people? Or perhaps even be unpopular? <laughs> uh, uh, people should not clip their dogs, because... People clip their dogs right in the beginning of winter and then they put coats on them. And I don't understand why you would clip the dog's fur and then put a coat on it because it's cold because you just clipped off its fur. <laughs> I don't understand why people put you coats know, on dogs. I recognize people's freedom to do that. I just don't understand. 